we were learning about solving equations using graphs and we were drawing lines and we were told we drew these two lines on this piece of graph paper and they intersected in one point and this was the solution and i came back home and i said to my father i have a problem with this lesson because like those two lines that intersected if we keep drawing them around the world then they're going to intersect again somewhere in australia and my dad's like, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. Graph paper, you don't wrap it around the world. It's just flat and it goes on forever. Right. I was, okay, right. And then later <laughs> on, you kind of find out that it's not at all clear if the universe goes on forever, right? Maybe the universe, the universe is probably a finite size, right? It's right. getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but it had a beginning right. and it can only move at the speed of light. So it's actually a finite size. So math doesn't actually fit in our universe. Mm. But on the other hand, you know how to count, right? One, two, it's the first thing you learn in math. And after a while, it dawns on you that like given any number at all, you can always add one and make a bigger number. Yeah. So beyond some point, those numbers ain't going to fit in our universe. But does that mean that math is wrong? It just means that math is not physics. Welcome, welcome. How are you? Fine. You know, how do we get a computer to think? You know, like how do we, you, we're, we're doing these algorithms and we sort of think of um, artificial intelligence in a certain kind of simplistic way, but how do you actually get a computer to think? Yeah, I, I don't know. You know? That's a really hard question. I know that there's a whole lot of people thinking about it and using different yeah. techniques, but they're tr I mean, trying to work out what the question is, is already quite hard. I mean, what do yeah. you mean by getting it to computers, well, computers at chess? Are they thinking like, well, I don't think they probably, years ago? I don't Go think on. they, I don't think they probably are really. I mean, we see some things like with quantum computers that kind of look like it, but you know, I think the thing is, is this more, you know, how do we get a computer to understand what an algorithm is or a proof is? Yeah. I mean, we can, we can tell them the rules, but that's kind of slightly different to giving them an understanding. Yeah. You know, computers are very autistic things. You tell them the rules and they obey the rules. Right. And you're asking them to be innovative, which is somehow different. And I mean, the AI people are doing things, you know, they, they're using language models and they're using stuff. But I mean, right now, I wouldn't say there's too much evidence that they're thinking. Yeah, they're just very, very, very fast. Maybe that makes up for it. Yeah, right. I mean, how do we get them so that they can verify a proof? Ah, well, th this we can do because we can tell them the rules. Computer programs follow rules, right? If we teach mm -hmm. a computer the rules of mathematics, and then we say, "Here's a here's a bunch of code written in that type theoretic language where we've expressed those rules." Now, could you please check that this follows the rules of mathematics? If you give it enough hints, it can do that. You tell it the rules of maths and you say, is this correct? They say, sure. But then next question you can say is, well, what's the answer to this one? And they're like, right. oh, why don't you just tell me? You tell me, I'll check. <laughs> okay, let's back up for a minute. You do specialize in something called al algebraic number theory, which already is giving me anxiety because I was <laughs> not a math person. But what is algebraic number theory? What, what does it mean? And why is it important that we understand it? I mean, broadly speaking, you can divide maths into the discrete and the continuous. And the continuous is the geometry and the discrete is the algebra. So I guess if I'm an algebraic number theorist, I must be on the discrete side of things. So I'm thinking about questions that involve the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, five, right? Whereas on the geometry side, people are thinking about the real numbers, like all the numbers with pi and e and all the, you know, a continuum of numbers. So I think about discrete problems, and a great example of a problem in my area is a very hard question known as Fermat's Last Theorem, which is a just a goofy question about positive whole numbers. You know, it took like 200 years to solve it. Yeah, right? yeah it, took, it took centuries to solve. This was the cute thing. It could be stated 400 years ago. It's just a statement that three squared out of four squared is five squared. That's the thing. You can just check, right? Nine out of 16 is 25. But... I can be pretty confident that eight cubed add nine cubed is not going to be 10 cubed or that 53 to the power seven add 89 to the power seven is 92 to the power seven because Fermat conjectured 
I mean, the 1600s, that you could never get answers to those equations. You can't find sum of two seventh powers as a seventh power and stuff like this. So this was an idle question with no practical applications back then. And 350 years later, Andrew Wells and Richard Taylor solved it using a huge amount of modern mathematical machinery, which is the kind of machinery that I use in my work. So that's that's what algebraic number theory is. It's developing modern tools to solve goofy equations like that in the whole numbers. And now you asked, what's the point of it? Yes. How does that apply to another so, world? Or yeah. So Fermat's last theorem has no applications at all, really. It was just an idle question that turned out to be extremely difficult. So here's one of the points of Fermat's last theorem. If you manage to come up with a question that turns out to be so profoundly hard that it can drive the development of an entire theory, then you found the right question because that's how we make progress in all areas, not just in mathematics, by sort of striving to do things that we can't quite do yet. And when you're being driven forward like that with these motivations in mind, you end up inventing a whole bunch of new stuff. And along the way, algebraic number theorists invented things like elliptic curves and arithmetic of finite fields, which all sound a bit abstract until suddenly you realize that you can use this stuff to do encryption, which in the 1940s, you know, hundreds of years after Fermat turned out to be phenomenally important. If the Nazis used bad encryption and they were caught out by Turing. And so you want to use much better encryption. And these modern tools, which we developed to do something completely different, randomly ended up being useful for something else. Now, what so, were your thoughts about Turing, you know, and, you know, how he broke the codes during World War II? Yeah, he was a pretty smart guy. I mean, obviously he was treated terribly. He understood what a computer was before they existed. That was the big thing. Like before him, there was Babbage and Ada Lovelace. Uh, you know, Babbage had the vision of the first computer and Ada Lovelace had the vision of the first computer program. But that was a hundred years before computers were ever built. And then Turing took up their ideas again and understood what computers could do. But technology was now sufficiently advanced that we could actually make them. So they made they made Turing a computer, uh, which he could use to, you know, crack the Nazi codes. And, you know, it's difficult to know what would have happened without him. But, uh, you know, Turing and his team at Bletchley Park, you know, they say in the UK, well, you know, he shortened the length of, the, of World War II by three years. So that's kind of useful. Uh, that's a bit of an, unsu you know, a bit of a surprising application of algebraic number theory. Yeah. Are there other examples how we see algebraic number theory in real life? You know, we see it all around us, but we don't think about it. I am going to say no. I mean, if you're, you're typing your credit card into the internet, your simple algebraic number theory is behind that kind of thing. But really, beyond some point, algebraic number theory is, the, is a big study of patterns and very, very abstract patterns. And this is, as a, as a mathematician, I think one of the things that really got me into it uh, was because I like patterns. My daughter, I have a daughter who really wanted to do well in mathematics, but somehow it never stuck. And I think somebody like her, she stares at that table of, that times tables, the multiplication square, whatever you call it. And I'm looking at that going, whoa, look at this nine. It's like nine three to 27, nine fours to 36, nine fives to 45. And that's going up by one and that's going down by one. And there's kind of crazy patterns everywhere. And like, where are the mm. odd ones and where are the evil ones and color things in? And there's all kind of secrets in this number table. Whereas I think many people look at that number square and it's just like, looks like a massive pain, you know, just... <sighs> Yeah, a and, bunch and, of things that you just have to learn and like who even cares about the beauty you don't find it beautiful like I don't find the works of Beethoven at all beautiful oh I was just going to ask you about music because there's that sort of stereotype that if you're a mathematician you're also a musician yeah. or do you like music or do you play music so what about I Radiohead I, <laughs> Radiohead are great yeah I was at that Glastonbury I, I mentioned Beethoven specifically because... But it's interesting because it's beautiful in terms of the numbers. And you don't see the numbers in Beethoven? No, I don't see the numbers in Beethoven, no. Mm. Maybe I'm not trying hard enough. Maybe there's people out there that can't see the numbers. But you see, if someone tells you, this thing, this thing is beautiful, you just have to try a lot harder. Yeah, <laughs> It's not kind of something you're going to buy, right? Whereas I'm looking at that number table thinking, this is kind of great. There's all sorts of hidden little secrets in here. Do you see Beethoven or do you hear Beethoven? So in other words, it, or any music, is it one, two, three, one, two, three? Like, are you <laughs> patterns of, right? <laughs> right? I, That's numbers. 
Listen, there are numbers in music. And in fact, the kind of music, I listen to a lot of electronic music, which is made by, you know, by what I used to call synthesizers or made nowadays by computers. I mean, drum and bass music, you make it with a computer and the, and the drum pattern is extremely rhythmical. And there's also, there's a band called Orteca uh, who mm -hmm. make very strange or who used to make very strange non-repetitive drum beats as well in their music but yet there were there was even more subtle patterns in their work so I do sometimes see patterns in music but I think that Beethoven is more an emotional thing I'm not really sure that numbers are emotional I think I mean I'm quite an autistic person so did I'm not so say, good at emotion so Beethoven say, doesn't work so wait well. wait did you say autistic like autistic yeah yeah hey, you, uh, yeah 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 I'm not at all an artistic person that's my daughter <laughs> like so I'm not a math person at all but I do like when there's symmetry in numbers but suddenly when it's my son was born oh nine oh nine nine four like and I got oh, that's very cool. yeah, it was yeah. pretty there's <laughs> lyricism and there's and I don't see the patterns but other people do like yourself that the patterns that you're you're excited about it's your life's work as a mathematician do you see those out in nature for example or do you not like are you not a grass or a flower or a tree or a sky person either no i'm terrible i i mean it's a terrible thing to say but i absolutely loved the lockdown i got to stay at my house for a year and a half and i didn't have to kind of talk to real people other than my family who i dearly love and uh yeah i didn't have to go outside i have can you i suppose you might be able to see it I, there's some sort of exercise bike behind me yeah i do i see is that a peloton <laughs> It's a, I have one of those. It's, a, it's a cross trainer and, and during lockdown my kids were doing things like going out cycling and stuff like this but mm. I was just pedaling every day on that cross trainer okay, well I sort of did a similar thing and I live in California where it's really beautiful but I was like <laughs> on my peloton just like racking up the miles there but no I'm terrible I I'm not a big fan of the real world I you know there's all this fuss about the virtual you, you know all this uh, the metaverse or wherever we're going in the future but yeah I'm all in you're all in. Oh, I way. really like the idea, yeah. Jesse, by the way, Kevin <laughs> for the mathematics and NFTs for another day, right? Mm. Um, that might be really beautiful to think about. Anyway. You know, um, do you see numbers in your mind or do you just see them when they're written down? That's a funny question. Uh, I guess I think about math problems, but the math problems I think about tend not to involve numbers at all because the idea is you see the numbers and then you see the pattern and you express the pattern probably in terms of algebra. And so I think about variables. I think about, I'm more likely to be thinking about X than two <laughs> rather than concrete. Exact. If, if I want to know something to do with actual numbers, I just compute it on a computer. There's no point engaging your brain. Like I, I remember back in the day, I could remember my friend's cell phone numbers when I, you know, uh, three of my friends had cell phones. It's just like, well, I, I you know, I learned your landline. It's going to learn your cell phone. But then beyond some point, you're just like, wait a minute, I've got a machine in my pocket that can just remember. Your, I don't need to remember your cell phone. Right. You know, I know my partner's cell phone. Uh, I'm not convinced I know all of my kids' cell phone numbers. So one of them, you just said, not interested in the, the math thing. It's a terrible thing. It's a okay. terrible thing. My daughter found maths interesting, but somehow never got it. Okay. And my two sons, uh, you know, they did all, they did maths till eighteen, and uh, so it's the terrible stereotypical thing that like it's the boys do maths and mm. the girls that don't. And this is something that I really try to fight against in my life. I used to be an active algebraic number researcher, so I was trying to do. Yeah, algebraic number theory is a broad subject and it grows all the time and i used to be right there at the frontiers trying to push algebraic number theory forwards and then i rather changed area and nowadays i tend to spend my time teaching the more core fundamental parts of algebraic number theory to a computer and so because i switched area and this was quite a new area i thought this is sort of a great chance to sort of try and fix the balance and get a good male female ratio Right. I've always been actively trying to encourage women to join our crazy gang of formal. Well, they're not crazy. Some people are doing it very seriously. Join our gang of formalizers, and uh, you know, and trans women as well. It's just and, and just trans people in general. I'm, I'm very keen on it being an incredibly broad. You know, it's a new area, and so now's the time to, you know, to decide what our area is going to look like. Is it hard to get people um, to understand math? I only ever see people who have decided that they want to understand math on the whole in right. my in my work life 
I go to work and I get put in front of 250 first year undergraduates. And every single one of those people has got a stamp on their forehead saying, I've come to university to do math and only math. That's right. how the system works in the UK. It's not like, oh, you major in math and you'll take some English course and you come to university and you do math and that's all you do. I'll tell you the thing that's difficult is that at school, a lot of the math you do uh, is calculations. Here's a formula work out what the formula says you know what number do you get so it is kind of number based but then when you go to university it's less about computations and it's more about reasoning at school they might say you know work out the first five prime numbers okay and that's a calculation you can do it the answer is a list of numbers but at university they might say prove there's infinitely many prime numbers so now the answer to that doesn't involve explicit numbers at all you need to create some kind of algorithm that if you have finitely many prime numbers, then you need to make another one. And then you just keep running the algorithm to get your infinite set. Right. So that there's a change in emphasis that I don't think is really well advertised to people at school. I think some people really find it quite a culture shock uh, when they go to university and all, or all of a sudden they're being asked to reason. They, they say, what's the method? You've got to say, yeah, there isn't a method now. You've got, to, you've got to be thinking on your feet. This comes back to your first question about how do, how do we get a computer to think? I mean, maybe if I understood how I thought myself, maybe I'd be better at teaching these people. When these people come and they just, you know, they say, I'm out, I don't, the school, they gave us the problem. They told us the method. I applied the method diligently and I got the correct answer to the problem. Where's the method here? Mm -hmm. so it doesn't work like that. This is a big maze. And you've got, there, to, you've got to sniff your way through. Sorry, go on. Sorry, no, you are there. Are there infinite numbers? Like you, you were talking just now, and then I'm thinking about, you know, ex people that are exploring. We've talked to people that are going out to the infinite galaxies and other, yeah, you uh -huh. know. But are there infinite numbers? Yes, there are, because numbers are not of this universe. Ah, where this well, is what here? happens. Numbers live in a different universe. Cool. This is the difference between math and physics. And this took me a while. It took a while for this to dawn on me. When, when I was a kid, we were learning about solving equations using graphs. And we were drawing lines. And we, were we drew these two lines on this piece of graph paper and they intersected in one point and this was the solution. And I came back home and I said to my father, I have a problem with this lesson because like those two lines that intersected, if we keep drawing them around the world, then they're going to intersect again somewhere in Australia. And my dad's like, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. Graph paper, you don't wrap it around the world. It's just flat and it goes on forever. Right. I was, okay, right. And then later on, you kind of find out that it's not at all clear if the universe goes on forever, right? Maybe the, uni the universe is probably a finite size, right? right? It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but it had a beginning. Right. And it can only move at the speed of light. So it's actually a finite size. So math doesn't actually fit in our universe. Mm. But on the other hand, you know how to count, right? One, two, it's the first thing you learn in math. And after a while, it dawns on you that like given any number at all, you can always add one and make a bigger number. Yeah. So beyond some point, those numbers ain't going to fit in our universe. But does that mean that math is wrong? It just means that math is not physics. Wow. Math is used to explain the universe. You know, that's attempting to do physics using mathematics. You know, mathematics is the language of physics. But pure mathematics by itself, the kind of mathematics I'm interested in, that takes place in a different place. Maybe you could call it the platonic universe. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that you can totally imagine. Stuff like circles, right? Circles can't exist because circles are infinitely thin, right? And mm -hmm. spheres can't exist either because spheres are perfectly smooth. They're not made out of atoms and stuff like that. So that's where that's where these things, if the perfectly smooth spheres and the circles, they live in this different place. This it's like an imaginary world. Um, is the goal of mathematics to describe the world we live in? Uh, that's one of the goals of mathematics. That's what the physicists want to do, and it's kind of interesting just watching it happen because. One way of interpreting the you know, results in physics is that they always get it wrong at every stage. Like Newton had some great ideas, but actually he was a bit wrong. And then like, you know, Einstein had some great ideas, but yeah, you know, eventually everything is kind of a bit wrong. Like string theory and gravity and quantum mechanics, all these theories, they don't quite gel with each other because they're all a little bit wrong. And then later on, we find better models by pessimistic meta reduction. They're all going to be wrong. So, right. But well, on the other the... hand, they're enough to get we're enough to get us to the moon, right? Yeah. So well, it's kind it's like... of is good enough. <laughs> but yeah, 
I mean, what do you think the difference between the scientific method is and, you know, being a believer in certain kinds of, you know, uh, magical beings who help us out down here on planet Earth? Aha, uh -huh. religion. I mean, the, the big difference, I guess, the big difference between mathematics and religion is religion is taking some statement which purports to apply to the physical world mm -hmm. and is telling you that you've just got to believe it on trust. You know, there is a God. And if you look around, you know, the idea is you're supposed to see evidence of that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a leap of faith. And there's mm. a whole lot of very smart people in the world. And there's many religions as well. And so mm -hmm. it's not just like if there was an obvious right way to work all this out, then all the smart people would have worked it out and they'd all be that religion. Mm -hmm. So religion, religion involves these kind of axioms that you can't argue with. Like, you know, there is a God. And then mathematics also involves axioms. Like one of the axioms of mathematics is like there exists a set, which is basically like, there exists a number. Mm -hmm. you know, you've got to start somewhere. And the axioms are pretty primitive. But the thing about these axioms is as, as a formalist, my interpretation of these axioms is that they're making statements about what's going on in that platonic universe, not the physical universe. Right. They can't be used to actually make you know, judgments about you know, how I'm supposed to be behaving in the physical universe. Mathematics is a formal game. The kind of mathematics I do is a formal game which exists only in the platonic universe. So right. it's, it's different to religion in that respect. In some sense, you don't even have to believe the axioms. If you like, all of the theorems that I have proved in my mathematical career, they don't say this theorem is true. They say this theorem follows from this list of axioms. And, and that statement is you don't need to have faith to believe that statement. You can check it yourself. Yeah, well, that should we need a little more of that thinking in the world right now, right? <laughs> People no, start but, thinking about, can I check this myself? Yeah. Well, the... I mean, that's a great point. I mean, you live in a different universe, which which I don't understand, but I have great admiration for the way that you think about things, that the, the spending your life on these, these to me, feel abstract. They probably don't, I don't know if they do for you. I'm trying to come back to this kind of thinking that you do, that rigor of thinking. How do we bring that rigor or problem solving or questions to problems? How can that thinking be applied where we desperately need it in this world that the real, not this world, the real right. world? Yeah, yeah, reality. Yes, reality. So I have been doing mathematics for quite a long time now, and I've met quite a lot of mathematicians. And I've seen some of these people that really try and boil reality down to a system of rules and act in quite a, a rigid, I mean, I think there's a danger of trying to apply too many rules to reality because reality is kind of complicated. And so we don't want to be, we don't want to go too far. And flexibility is really important to me. And it's one of the things that being a parent taught me. You've got the plan for what's going on. This is something my partner taught me many right at the beginning of of our journey into parenthood. Uh, she read in a book. Typically, a parent's default answer is no. Like we're doing something and then the kid is like, can we just go and do that for a minute? Like, no, because we're going home. Like the default answer is no. And if you just change your default answer to yes, then you're not going to lose much. It's going to make everyone much happier. Yeah. So very early on, we changed our default answer to yes. And from the moment you do that, you've got this random variable, right? You've got a four-year-old child yeah. and suddenly saying, well, you think you know what the rules are, but we're going to do something else now. Mm. And once you start realizing... Right, that's what life is really. I had a really happy time as a young father. And I've had a really, I've got a really good relationship with all my children. And I think one of the reasons for that is that on the whole, I've been quite a laid back parent and I've allowed them to take me off the beaten track. So I think it's important to know when to break the rules as well. You know, the other side of the coin is what about fake news? Because people have got to be encouraged to yeah. start looking at things they see on TikTok or things they see wherever and thinking, well, can I kind of independently verify that? Is this a reputable source of information? And I think Donald Trump did a great job of really kind of confusing that whole concept of what a, reputa you know, what a reputable source of information is. And now all of a sudden, I mean, I don't know if it was Trump, but it might have been social, it might have been Twitter. I don't know what it was. But nowadays, it seems to be some confusion where people see things on the internet and then just think, well, that must be true because I've seen it on the internet. And that's where I spend a whole lot of my time now. I mean, that's a difficult problem that I know very little about. I agree that it's slightly concerning. <laughs> I would add slightly in capitals, all caps. Uh -huh. 
maybe replace it with a different oh, word. Extremely. Extremely concerning. <laughs> but you just don't know what's going to happen. I also, I have this sort of funny feeling at the back of my mind that at any point in time, there's a whole subset of the world who's looking at it in horror and thinking, this is a whole lot worse than it used to be. But I think that's just kind of happening all the time. Well, and, that's an, uh, well, that's an interesting question. Sorry, I didn't mean to, I loved what you're no, saying. But this seems to me in my long life, like the worst that it's ever been. But okay, you hear that every generation, World War II, right? They were saying this is the worst. Uh, is it the worst? And if you think about the continuum, like, is this the worst? point that we've ever been at or I mean, you've asked at a pretty lousy time <laughs> yeah. so, right covid is finished right for some reason apart from if you're in china because the, the variant that's everywhere is giving people you know mildly annoying back i mean it's still killing people mm -hmm. uh, but it's people are getting hit by cars right and we're not and we're not trying to ban cars so you know more people are dying than they used to be but everybody in london was really really good about masks on the subway when right. we were in lockdown, and now nobody wears them at all. Really? I walk around London with my mask on because I quite like wearing a mask. But uh, actually, in the last few, I must confess, in the last few weeks, I've even stopped wearing a mask. But mm. the simple reason was that uh, four weeks ago, I had a positive COVID test and uh, I had a day in bed with, mm. a, with a mild temperature. Ten days after that, I'm just figuring, well, now I'm immune and I'm also not going to pass it on to anyone else. So I even stopped wearing a mask. Wow. So COVID is over. So at least that's better than last year. I mean, R Russia is terrible. You know, I was supposed to be giving a talk in Russia and going to a conference in Georgia over the summer. But mm -hmm. I, the, the conference in Russia has been cancelled. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of bad. But on the other hand, there's normally a few wars happening. I mean, there's been a war in Yemen. South Sudan is kind of terrible. Yemen is terrible. We don't talk so much about them. Yeah, I mean, these are in some sense wars that are quite a long way away. I mean, Russia is just a general, you know, Russia is a far scarier yeah. uh, thought than many other countries. So that's kind of bad. But then, you know, it might all go away or it might get worse. But let's be an optimist and say that eventually it goes away. Yeah. Well, we uh, like the optimism. Then what else is wrong? You know, what are the big things? Oh, climate change. That's pretty awful. But mm -hmm. do you know what? Again, I'm an optimist. I think science is going to solve it. Mm -hmm. I think science will beat politics in the end Be because I mean science is my religion right that's yeah that, that's yeah. kind of what happened yeah I've seen science win before I, I saw science you know solve the ozone layer problem when I was a kid I was just like oh hole in the ozone layer it's gonna be horrible we're all gonna get skin cancer yeah and then scientists were like oh wait a minute we found out what's causing it okay and now we've banned it Kevin it's been wonderful to kind of yeah a lot to think about and there's a lot. By the way, we are working on a on a project that is hashtag science wins. We we totally agree. Oh, great! With that. <laughs> yeah, it, it has to do. It had to do with like it, it, it's a whole other thing. But it, it's about it, it really celebrating scientists. But yeah, and I and I was going to ask you about your religion, but I didn't want to pry. But then you told us that that uh, science was science your religion. Is my religion. Very yeah. very wonderful. Mm. <laughs> with you. Yeah. And so thank you, Kevin, very much. Thank That's you right. so Quite much. Enjoyable. We're so glad Thank we you. really got to meet you. Okay. Yeah. Bye, you guys. Cheers.